Um, my name's Alex Brown. Welcome to my version of the horse slaughter situation in the United States as it stands today, which is the end of um, 2014. Um, I promise you there's nothing gory in this video, so please watch it. Um, if you want to look at gory horse slaughter stuff or any kind of slaughter stuff which is gory, you can Google that on YouTube, I'm sure. Um, I am anti-slaughter, so some of the perspective will be based around that, but I'm going to try to be as broad as possible and as neutral as possible. The content of this video is based on my own experiences. I've traveled throughout the United States. I've been to kill auctions, feedlots, slaughterhouses, not inside but the outside. I've worked in racing for a number of years. I've worked at several different racetracks and I've also visited several racetracks and rodeos throughout North America. Um, I've worked with people in the anti-slaughter movement. I've lobbied in Washington, D.C. I've researched and written a book, and I can also use Google and Wikipedia to fill in the gaps. The current state of the horse slaughter industry in the United States is one of flux. Um, the European Union, which is a major market for horses and, and horse meat coming out of the United States, um, de ha has decided to ban horse meat from Mexico um, beginning January 15th. Um, that's a huge um, issue simply because about two-thirds of horses slaughtered in the United States are um, being exported down to Mexico, slaughtered there, and, and then shipped over to the um, European Union. Um, the, the actual situation for slaughter in, in the United States is basically um, a situation where we have outsourced um, slaughter um, to Canada and to Mexico with, again, the major markets um, um, then going to the European Union. Um, th that um, situation, aside from um, the EU's decision, um, will persist at least through September 2015 because of the defunding language in the current spending bill um, in Congress. The actual supply chain for horse slaughter in the United States is, is thriving and very healthy. Um, it's a clandestine system. Um, it comprises horse traders um, who, uh, who trade horses then with kill buyers who have contracts with um, slaughterhouses in Mexico or Canada. Um, the kill buyers would then ship horses potentially to feedlots, feedlots through export pens um, or, 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 or up through into Canada, and then exported to, to, the, to the slaughterhouse. This situation is not ideal, um, quite honestly, for anybody. It's not ideal for the pro-slaughter folks who would much rather um, slaughter horses directly in the United States and shorten the supply chain. It's not ideal for the anti-slaughter folks who would much rather um, we don't slaughter our horses at all. And it's not ideal for the horse because the horse is, is clearly having to um, be shipped further in, in, in um, and quite honestly pretty dreadful um, conditions. Um, the two main lobbies on this issue are obviously the pro-slaughter lobby and the anti-slaughter lobby. The pro-slaughter lobby um, comprises um, horse industries, comprises vet, vet organizations, um, and um, breeding organizations. They're well funded, they're well organized, and, um, and um, you know, they, they, their goal is to, to uh, bring back um, domestic horse slaughter, of which um, there, are, there are possibilities, obviously, once if, if the defunding language in Congress um, doesn't persist beyond September 2015. The anti-slaughter lobby is comprised mostly of animal welfare and animal rights groups, very passionate people um, in horse rescue and so on and so forth. Um, the reality, however, is um, these organizations are not as well funded and there is competition amongst these organizations um, um, for funding sources and so forth, so that creates some level of dysfunction on the anti-slaughter slide, which is not um, um, there with the pro-slaughter slide. The other side is typically horsemen in the um, various horse industries um, listen to and agree with the, the horse industry's viewpoint on, on this subject simply because a lot of the anti-slaughter rhetoric is coming from organizations that um, spend a lot of um, energy demonizing um, all horse sports. Um, so that sort of affects um, the, the industry's sort of um, understanding of, of their rhetoric.
I want to take a step back for a, a couple of minutes and try to sort of get a better understanding of the horse as, as it exists in the culture in um, America, because I think that helps us inform um, our perspective on the horse slaughter issue. I think it's important for us to recognize the, 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 the role the horse has played in the history of the United States. The horse was first introduced by the Spanish um, coming up through uh, Mexico, I suppose, um, into the United States and actually became um, a very useful for the, for, the, for the Native Americans at the time, before us English went and wiped them all out, I suppose, but very useful for them for their, to change their sort of hunter-gatherer culture um, and sort of enable them with their sort of buffalo hunts and so on and so forth. Um, again, obviously, as English, we ended up ruining that. But nevertheless, um, useful for the Native Americans, very useful for um, us explorers coming from east to the west, uh, whether it's transportation. Um, if you didn't have a horse, you weren't going anywhere. Um, and, and, you know, a means of agriculture. Um, so you, if you didn't have an, anything mechanical at the time, which you didn't, um, it was the horse that was going to pull the plough and so on and so forth. And if you look at the history of the Pony Express, obviously um, Wells Fargo owns a lot of its history to, um, to, to the horse. Um, so, you know, there's no doubt up until the early um, 1900s, the horse played an enormous role in terms of our progress. Um, and then we had the sort of the evolution of, the, of the, the, the engine, I suppose, or whatever it was, whatever Ford did to basically make the car available to lots of people, um, clearly had a massive impact on, on the relevance of the horse for transportation. And then um, as we progressed into ag the, the mechanics coming into agriculture, probably 10, 15, 20, 30 years later, I, I'm not precisely sure on, on that, but let's say towards the Second World War era, um, the role of the horse in agriculture um, more generally um, um, got um, shifted um, shifted away. So, you know, right now the reality is we don't need the horse. Um, the reality was we absolutely needed the horse and we wouldn't be sat here today if it wasn't for the horse. Um, there are five, or as far as I can figure out anyway, there are five subcultures um, in um, the United States in terms of their perspective to the horse. There's the English culture, obviously of which I am a part of, the Spanish culture, um, the Western culture, the Native American culture, and the Amish um, culture. And each of these different cultures have different uses um, for the horse, whether it's recreational use, sports use, work use, um, and obviously the wild horses, um, which are predominantly out west. Um, I want to go into the sports um, issues first. Um, and the sports is basically, um, there are two major sports uh, for the horse um, in America. It's horse racing and um, rodeo. Um, in terms of horse racing, um, we have the traditional track meet horse racing, which uh, most people are familiar with um, as they follow the Kentucky Derby um, or the, the Breeders' Cup possibly. Um, maybe one or two people have heard about Saratoga, Del Mar and so forth. Those are the highbrow meets that people typically hear of. But the reality is track meet horse racing is vast. There's about a hundred active track meets throughout um, America and the majority of racing is actually claiming racing. Um, where, where horses run at a certain price point and other horsemen can claim the horse from them at that price point and take them and, and train them themselves. The claiming system, um, whilst convenient for the horsemen, can be a bit, bit problematic for the horse itself because um, we, 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 we do use drugs quite liberally in horse racing, some legal, some not legal, um, unfortunately. Um, and medical records do not travel with the horse when the horse is claimed, so then new horsemen don't know how the horse has been treated and so forth. So that's not particularly good. And um, this sort of short-term um, idea of people sort of only owning a horse for three or four races, again, um, doesn't uh, um, set up too well um, for the horse. This is a sort of a, a potentially a minority of horses get trapped into the system, but nevertheless, it's not a very good um, situation. Um, 
There is certainly at each of these racetracks, I would say there's a, at least a one horse trader on, on these racetracks helping sort of trade horses off the racetracks to various other places. If it's at Churchill Downs, they might be trading the horse down to Mountaineer Park or something like that. Don't believe it doesn't happen, it does. Um, but if it's a lowbrow track, it could be trading the horse out of the horse racing system altogether into the option system. Um, some racetracks have um, no slaughter policies, which is absolutely fantastic on the surface. It certainly signals that the horse racing industry is taking um, um, greater strides on, on getting a handle on this issue. The reality is, however, the un, uh, unintended consequence of such um, um, policies means some of these horses aren't any longer shuffled to auctions where there's public disclosure and, and potential for rescue. They're getting shuffled straight to kill buyers collecting stations um, where there's less scrutiny um, um, and, and, and so forth. Um, so, so that's the major horse racing that most people are familiar with. We also have in this country a fair meat circuit, also um, um, known as the bush track um, racing circuit. But these are horse races that, um, where, where the meets are typically three or four days long. They're associated with fairs oftentimes. Um, the purse money is much less. Um, and there's no stabling on the backside. Um, and what this does actually is mean that often the, the owners of horses in, in uh, these fair meets are, are in it purely for the pleasure of it um, because it's not such a financially viable um, opportunity. Um, and, um, and maybe some horsemen are obviously in it from a professional standpoint, but nevertheless, um, that is a little bit of a difference. Um, 60% of the horses typically are thoroughbreds at these meets, 40% are, are quarter horses. Um, a lot of these horses actually do come from the low-end um, track meets. Um, they're either claimed from those meets or purchased, and then they transition into the, the, the fair meets. Um, the quarter horses are typically um, locally bred um, horses. Um, another type of fair meet is a fair meet on an Indian reservation, um, of which I've actually been to one, the Crow Nation Fair, um, in, out in Montana. Um, because they are on Indian nations, they are entirely unregulated, which um, creates a whole other set of problems. Unregulated in terms of drug policy, unregulated in terms of pretty much anything. Um, I, I saw one valet jump on a horse and, 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 and ride it in the race because there weren't enough jockeys for that race. I just thought that was kind of a bizarre um, um, scenario. Um, the, um, the other unique aspect of Indian Fermi uh, racing is the Indian relay races, uh, where you have um, uh, Native Americans, I suppose I should say, um, riding a horse around the racetrack, jumping off one onto the next and doing it about three or four times. Um, this is very popular amongst those um, fairs, and then there's, I think, a national championship somewhere out there in the, um, in the Western States. Um, other types of racing um, is quarter horse racing, obviously I mentioned that a little bit because part of the fair meets includes quarter horse racing but there is also quarter horse racing at track meets um, and at those track meets um, some are um, exclusive to quarter horse racing but some have mixed meets with thoroughbreds so um, the racing um, in, in various southwest states um, very popular um, quarter horse racing whether it's New Mexico, Texas, um, out in California and, and, and so on and so forth. And, and that's just, again, reg, uh, uh, traditional regulated racing. There is another type of racing, it's called match racing. Um, this is, again, entirely unregulated racing. And, and actually it's legal, as long as no gambling occurring at those match races, the reality is there's plenty of gambling, plenty of other stuff going on, lots of unregulated stuff. So. Um, it's um, also quite hard to know the breadth and scope of match racing. It's prevalent in Texas, New Mexico, um, uh, Colorado, California. Um, there's even a Facebook page for a, 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 a match race that, that occurs in Southern California. Um, but it's, it, it could well be prevalent in other parts of the country, but because it's illegal, it's, it's not well advertised. Chuck wagon racing is another form of racing where thoroughbreds might if at the end of the meets up in Assiniboia Downs and a couple of other meets up in, in, in Canada might go chuck wagon racing because they do use thoroughbreds. Um, and um, chuck wagon racing is some crazy stuff at rodeos and, and, and um, quite spectacular, um, but certainly has, has some people um, um, concerned. Um, uh, we also have steeplechase racing. That's predominant on the East Coast, amateur and professional. Um, 
mostly that's um, hunt, hunt meat racing we would call, um, you know, just one meet on a weekend somewhere out in the country. There's some racing at track meets like Saratoga. And finally, but, but very importantly, there's harness racing. And harness racing might have actually predated um, thoroughbred flat racing. Um, that you, you really can't tell because in the old, old days, everything was on regulated racing. But harness racing um, is, is, is standard, standard bread racing, pacing, trotting um, in front of a cart um, and stems from um, our old transportation system. So um, there's a lot, a lot of history to harness racing. And if you live in a city um, that has a race street, um, that race street is named as such. Um, because that's where they used to run a bunch of um, unregulated, I suppose, harness racing. Dan Patch, a very famous harness racing horse in the early 1900s, would have been the most famous sports star of his um, era. Rodeo is the second major sport in, in the United States. Um, second, some would argue it's the first major sport in the United States for horses, certainly out in the Western States. Um, rodeo is actually the, um, of Spanish derivation um, and um, is obviously um, that's where a lot of the rodeo sport originally um, came from. It also has its roots in the ranching culture. Um, so, again, many of the sports you see at rodeo stem from sort of what you have to do on a working ranch to, to be successful. Um, there is a pro professional rodeo circuit. Um, and, um, and, and there's a major uh, regulatory body that, that runs that and um, other regulatory bodies run other rodeo circuits and there's also um, a, a bunch of unregulated rodeo and in the unregulated rodeo you might run into some problems with um, events like horse tripping and some other stuff that um, creates significant concern from animal rights um, groups. Um, big rodeos um, in places like Houston, Las Vegas, Calgary, Fort Worth, San Antonio, um, Cheyenne and so forth um, really attract huge, huge crowds, much more so than most of the horse racing, I would say. So, um, and, and the other interesting thing about those crowds is they are going up and up and up, or at least according to, to their organization. So um, Houston, um, over a sort of a two and a half week um, Rodeo will attract 1.3, 1.4 million or something like that, which is absolutely fantastic. If you compare that to a, a, a boutique horse race meet, I think Houston's rodeo might actually be quite favorable in terms of attendance. Um, the, um, the, the other interesting thing about the, those major rodeos is they are typically all, other than maybe the Cheyenne Frontier Days rodeo, all aligned with or associated with big livestock events. And clearly rodeo and livestock um, are heavily tied together um, and with big agriculture and, and so on and so forth. Um, in rodeo, there are basically two types of horses. Horses owned by the competitors doing their various um, tasks like roping calves or whatever it is they do in rodeo. And then rodeo owned by stock contractors who provide the horses for the, the, the bareback riding and the bronc riding and various other activities where the, the, the goal of the horse is to dump the rider. Um, and, and you could imagine that there's some uh, potential concern with what happens to some of those um, horses that are owned by the stock contractors. And, and my research, and I, I, again, I'm not really an expert on this, but from what I've learned, it's quite similar to horse racing. Some horses have good outcomes, some horses have bad outcomes and go to options and so on and, and so forth. Um, but that's um, just the um, reality. Um, rodeo is part of the cowboy culture. The cowboy culture, I think, is quite interesting. It's you know quite far removed from Washington, D.C. I think it's a culture of independence, a culture of self-reliance, less rules, and so on and so forth. Um, so I would imagine that cowboy culture is, is not inclined to have more regulation, etc., which, which certainly plays into the hands of the pro-slaughter lobby that do, you know, doesn't want um, to be regulated on how, how people can do whatever they choose to do with their horses. Um, the, the cowboy culture is also a fascinating tourist attraction, um, which, which again, I think the, the large rodeos that I mentioned a little bit earlier are, are great examples of that. So at those rodeos, you have obviously the horsemen involved. Um, you also have fans of rodeo going to those rodeos. But I do think a, a large portion of the 1.3 or 4 million are simply tourists that are attracted to come and check out their first rodeo. That, I think, is a little bit different to 
um, to, 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 to horse racing. I don't think we have too many tourists, sadly. And that might be because horse racing is all over the world, not concentrated in the Western um, states. Another aspect of the cowboy culture and that sort of Western culture is obviously the wild horse um, um, scenario, which I'll get to um, in a little bit. In terms of other horse sports, there are, there are some professionals in those horse sports, whether it's Western horse sports or English horse sports, but those professionals are the minority and a lot of those horse sports in, in, involve and include a lot of sort of pleasure, uh, pleasure riding.